Well, I think we all need to hear that message, right? Your focus needs more focus. You know, it's easy in our world to get distracted by things that, I'm not going to say they're not important, but they're not the most important. And if you're not careful, and you, if you don't keep the main thing the main thing, you will let other things come in that will distract you from the things that really matter, but most important, distract you from your relationship with Christ. And it's easy to do. It's easy to do. And it happens to all of us. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. It doesn't matter how long you've had your act together. It doesn't matter if you're a new Christian and you're on fire. It takes that long to get distracted, which we see in this story today. Now, here's our series verse for this series. Philippians 3.14 says this, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So Paul is saying to us uh, and to the early Christians, hey, I have a goal, and my goal is to do what God wants me to do every day, to look for the goals that he has for me. And it is easy to lose focus. Let me give you uh, where we're going to be headed today uh, in, a, in a verse. And um, I would have included this in the notes, but it kind of came to me a little bit later. It's Psalms 46.10. You're not going to see it on the screen yet. It'll be there later today. But here is where we're going to go with the three points. And the three points line up with this verse, the beginning of this verse in Psalms 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. If you don't hear anything else today, I'm going to say that several times, and I hope that you will take this with you and remember to do those three things. Be still and know that He is God, which, which means you're not, by the way, just so you know. So years ago, um, I had to fly back and forth to seminary class, and um, so I'd be carrying a book. I'd be flying from New Orleans back to Orlando. And uh, on one of the flights, I think it was Orlando to New Orleans. It may have been New Orleans to Orlando. It's been a long time ago, and my memory fades as the years go forward. But uh, I was on the plane, and I probably had an Old Testament survey. I would try to take as few bags as I could, so sometimes I'd carry a few books. So I probably had like an Old Testament survey or a New Testament survey book with me. And uh, uh, I would, I, we would take Southwest. And I, the old Southwest planes, the first row faced backwards. Did you know that? And it had like a circle. And, uh, and so families could sit up there. That was kind of the point. So I would never sit up there, but typically I was one of the first to try to get on the plane. So I would sit right behind that. And that's where I was sitting in the second, essentially the second row, the really third row. And uh, one of the uh, uh, stewardesses, they're not called stewardesses anymore. Flight attendants. My sister is a flight attendant, so I should know that. And if she's watching, I'm in trouble. Anyway, so... Um, so the flight attendant said to me, oh, oh, you're, you're a pastor. And I was a youth pastor. I said, yeah, I'm a pastor. I didn't feel like differentiating that. And that was kind of all the conversation, you know, and put that away. And anyway, as the flight, they were getting ready to close the door. As they were preparing to close the door, a family came literally pushing a member of the family on the plane. By the way, that is never a good sign. Just if you're ever on a plane and you see somebody being shoved onto or off of, a plane, those are not great things. And so they're basically pushing her on the plane. She is making lots of noise, but seems fairly normal. I'm thinking maybe she's nervous about the gap between the plane. No, no, she was afraid of flying. So they sit facing backwards in that first row. There's a row between, and then I'm in the next row behind that. As the plane takes off, she begins hollering, at any bump, any movement, any jostle, any turning, and she's crying out to Jesus loudly. Dear Jesus! And I can't do it as loud as she did it. People in the back of the plane could hear her crying out to Jesus for help. Over and over, she's crying out. So this goes on for probably 20, 30 minutes. Not a real long flight. I think it's like an hour and 15 minutes. The flight attendant comes to me. Yeah, this is why we don't tell people we're a pastor and says, she's a Christian lady. Could you sit with her and pray with her? No, no. I can't. Yeah, of course I said, yeah. So they traded my place with the person 
in front of me, so now I'm facing this screaming woman anytime we hit a bump. So I started talking to her. As she looked at me, I asked her questions. I prayed with her, and she immediately calmed down. It was amazing. I mean, I thought for a minute, God has just touched me with this supernatural gift of calmness. Nay, nay. (laughs) We hit some turbulence as we were getting ready to land, and she went back at it for the next 15 minutes, this time in my face. People in the back, I can hear them groaning like they wanted me to take care of it. She screams all the way as we land. I mean, any jostle, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, help me, oh, Jesus. He's helping you, you know, I don't know what to say. So we land, we go to get off the flight. We're all walking towards baggage, and I promise you, they were not looking at her. They were looking at me. Why couldn't you calm that woman down the whole time? And here's what I realize about that. When she was looking at me, and she wasn't thinking about the flight, and she was answering questions, and we were praying, she calmed down. She got focused. But when she started to look outside of the plane, she freaked out. Now, we all look at that, and we think, what a crazy woman. She would never get on there after uh, September 11th, right? They would get her right off the right. But the truth is, if we're honest, we're all that way sometimes. We love to look at other people and go, how can they not be calm in that situation? And yet, we allow all kinds of things to distract us from what's the most important. So today we're going to talk about how to focus on what's important. And here's number one. Number one, look for Jesus. And that goes to the be still part of that verse. Be still and know that I am God. So look for Jesus. Be still. When's the last time you really got still? You didn't allow the worries of the world to occupy you? Scientists actually say more of us are becoming ADD. Because we're distracted all the time by our devices, by the news, by the radio. We have so much input that our brains are jumping from task to task, from thought to thought. I want to encourage you, be still and look. For Jesus. Matthew 14, verse 25, very familiar passage says this. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. Now, the day before, Jesus had fed people. He had found out John had died. He had tried to hide, but then people came. They were hungry. Jesus had compassion on them, the Bible says, which is amazing. He's grieving. After that happens, Jesus goes on a mountainside to pray. He says to his disciples, you head across the lake. It's probably four or five miles where they were. They were probably about two or three miles across the lake, kind of like from the river over to where you see the rocket launch for the space center. And this is what they see. By the way, they were trying to row in. They couldn't get to the other side. They probably had rowed for five or six hours, theologians tell us. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost. They said and cried out in fear. I'll come back to that in just a second. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out, down out of the boat, walked on water, and came towards Jesus. Now let me go back to when the disciples freaked out. They were terrified. Why? Because they had let their imagination get the best of them. They were in the boat and they were fighting a storm and the the folklore back then for sailors was before you died, you would see a ghost, kind of like our grim reaper would come out to you. So here they are in the boat, they're rowing as hard as they can, and all of a sudden here comes Jesus. Now I don't know if he was wearing reflective clothing, if there was a full moon, I have no idea. But as he came out to them, the disciples, sailors, freaked out. Why? Why? Because they imagined something that wasn't true. Time out. Most of our fears and frustrations are about things that could happen. Many of the times that we walk in fear, it's because we're afraid of what's next instead of just dealing what's true now. Can you look for Jesus in the now? 
See, when a doctor says something to us and gives us a prognosis, our first thing is, worst case scenario, what could happen? When something happens to one of our loved ones or we see one of our kids wandering off and we wonder where they're headed, we, we start to have a scenario of the worst thing that could happen. When life deals us a difficult blow, we tend to focus on the difficult things that happen. Just like the disciples, we're no different. We're afraid. And yet, he's right there. And Peter did what we should do, and we're going to talk about in just a minute. So let me ask you this first question. Do I look for Christ, or am I seeking other things? And that happens in all kinds of things. Not, not everything we're seeking is bad even. It's not even bad things. But are we really seeking Him first? When we spend time in His Word, Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the Word of God. We have to believe what God's Word says. We have to allow it to flow inside of us. Have we gotten still and allowed Him to speak to us? So be still. Be still. Now, I'm going to give you a practical, this is a little box, it's some practical, real quick advice. And here it is. Praying for the fruit of the Spirit. This is a little practical exercise that you can do. You can do each of these three things separately with each of the fruit of the Spirit. You can do them all together with each fruit. But here's the fruit of the Spirit. So first, you focus on the characteristics. For example, let's just talk about love for a second. Love's the first one. Fruit of the Spirit is love. And then you confess where you've lost focus. Father, forgive me for not being loving in this situation or with this person. Okay? And then third, ask to be filled with this character. God, would you fill me with your love? Fill me with love for people I don't like. Did you know you could love people and not like what they do? God, help me to love people. And then the next one's joy. So you, say, so you look in your life and say, God, I haven't been very joyful lately i got to be honest. I've been focused on all kinds of things that have nothing to do with joy. Listen, if the, if the uh, early Christians could rejoice in jail, don't you think we can rejoice even when life seems crazy? Of course we can. Lord, fill me with your joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Take each of those separately and say, God, would you fill me with the fruit of your spirit? And... If you're not exhibiting these things, why not? Nobody has to tell an orange tree to get oranges. Nobody has to tell an apple tree to bear apples. If it's not, something is wrong. Either it's not an apple tree, or it hasn't been fertilized, or it hasn't been watered, or it hasn't been spending time in the sun. Some of us just need to spend some time in the sun, right? S-O-N, not S-U-N? For some of you both, right? So look for Jesus. Number two, beware of distractions. I am the most distracted person you probably know. Carl would agree. He's seen me cut down trees. He's like, I don't know how you don't die, right? So the verse says, be still, and this is the second part, and know. Know. Allow God's knowing, knowing who he is. Listen, we all have doubts. You can be a pastor for 30, 40 years and have doubts. You can struggle. The enemy will come and say, well, what if all this God stuff's not true? Paul even talked about that at one time. Hey, we're to be pitied. And when that happens to me, one of the things I think back on is I think of God's creation. How awesome it is. How intricate it is. Even just the, the principle of water is one of the things I love to go back to. Just the idea that ice floats. Most things, once they get cold, they sink. But ice, it becomes cold, it separates and floats. Otherwise, most of the earth would be ice most of the year. That one principle alone is why you and I can be here today. And God, the marvelous creator, put those things in place. And I remember, God, I see how wonderful you are and how powerful you are. Because we all struggle with doubt sometimes. You know, when you're doing certain things in building, you have to focus. When I was cutting some stone, some stone tile for my fireplace, I had these extra pieces. And here's why this piece is extra. It's because when I was doing it, I measured it, and I went outside, and I cut the angle the wrong way. Because for just a second, I got distracted between the time I walked from the fireplace out to the tile saw to have it spit all over me. I don't know if you've used a tile saw lately. They're very wet and disgusting and fun. But you've got to pay total attention when you're doing something important. Listen, the most important thing in your life is your relationship with Christ. Are you 
paying attention. Come, he said, and then here's what happened. Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water, and came towards Jesus. Do you realize this is like the most amazing verse in Scripture, and it's one sentence. Peter got down out of the boat. The other disciples, by the way, are still hiding. I think they're still going, I don't think it's him. That grim reaper is yelling out that he's Jesus now, right? You know, they're, they're, they're not getting at, they're not even offering. Peter's like, hey, if you could do that, could I do it? I totally think he's ADD, by the way. That's just my own personal thing. Walked on water and came towards Jesus. So he was doing great. Why? Because he was focused on Christ. But listen to what happened. When he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. Doubt and fear always go together. You begin to doubt. You begin to worry. You begin to think, God can't do this. I'm not sure God's going to help me through this. I, I, I'm not sure I can make it on my own. By the way, you don't have to. He says, I'm always with you. I will never leave you. Are we going to take him at his word? And when we do, we go in faith. And when you have faith, you know what comes along with faith? Hand in hand, peace. Peace. Because when you have faith, you say, you know what, God, I know you're going to work it out either way. And if God, if this is my last day on earth, guess what? Tomorrow's going to be an even better day. If I don't make it past today, then tomorrow morning I wake up in heaven. Do we sleep in heaven? I don't know. Maybe. But tomorrow will be even better. If I have the worst day here and I say, what does this button do? Hello, Jesus. What are you doing here? Right? If I trust him, then even in the storm, even when it looks like I may be destroyed, I can trust him. Why? Faith and peace go hand in hand. If you've lost your peace, it could be that some area of your life you've lost your faith. In Matthew 6, Jesus says this way, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Seek what he wants and seek doing what's right and, and the rightness in your heart. That's what righteousness is. And all of these things will be given to you as well. Does that mean all the money in the world? No, that's not what's important. All the things God wants you to do. Fulfillment. All the fruits of the Spirit. Boy, wouldn't it be awesome if you lived with joy and peace every day? Seek first his kingdom. Second question, what is my main distraction from Christ? It doesn't have to be anything bad. It could be as simple as too much work. It could even be your family, which is a wonderful thing. But, is it, but are you focusing more on them or worrying about them? Or are you trusting Christ with them? You see the difference? For a lot of people right now, it's too much news. I'll be honest, just too much news. Listen, it's good to know what's going on. It's not good to consume it like watching the weatherman tell you, the hurricane's coming, the hurricane's coming, the hurricane's coming, the hurricane's coming, the hurricane's coming. You watch that little loop over and over again. How many of y'all have done that? Come on now, right? I've done that. I've done that. Like, I just leave the TV on. I'm doing something else. I look back. I'm like, look, the hurricane's moved a whole inch, right? And we do that sometimes, and we let it consume us. Listen, do that with Christ. God, I'm going to turn my focus back to you. Take some time to praise and thank him. And no. Number three, call out to Jesus. I remember years ago meeting with somebody. Oh, by the way, this is the third one. So we have, we have the verse again. Be still and know that I am God. Or for you, you could say, he is God. You're not in charge. You, you don't have to handle everything. You can't handle everything. Somebody says, God never gives you more than you can handle. Yeah, he does. All the time. All the time. All, have you seen me up here? Have you figured this out yet? You should look up here and be like, if he can be a pastor. Why do you think so many pastors go from here to other churches? Because they're like, if he can be a pastor, I know I can be a pastor. Three pastors have left this church and now pastoring churches. I mean, so y'all are like, well, I can do that. Okay, good. Missions through stupidity. It's just, you know, they look up here. Hey, I can do that. Be still and know that he is God. You're not. You can't control it. You can't fix it. You can't put it back together. You can't go back. There's no rewind. What you did last week, you can't fix. You can apologize for it. Someone said to me years ago, they said, won't God get tired of me asking? Let me give you an answer. No. Never. He loves you more than you love anybody. I mean, those of us who have children who ask too many questions, at some point we just get like, 
yeah, okay, that's enough. Like we start answering blubbering, right? Like, I don't know, ask your mother. I have no idea, right? Right? And then the mom's like, how many times are you going to ask me that same question, right? Right? You can do that? God never does that. He never will leave you, never forsake you. You are more important to Him. The Bible says, God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son. Hey, He gave everything to know you. So He's not in heaven going, you're bothering Him. He loves it when you cry out to Him. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to stink, he cried out, Lord, save me. I love this. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. This is the second time. Matthew 8, they did the same thing. It's like they're learning. Truly, you're the Son of God. Why? Because the wind got still. They saw how... He is God. If you want to do better with the first two, be still and know. Allow him to be God in your life. Don't try to be God in your life. Don't try to be God in everybody else's life and control them. Realize that there's things in this world that you cannot fix. And you just have to say to God, God, I cry out to you. Knowing that you can handle this. That you can fix this situation, you can deal with this person, you can deal with this difficulty. And God, in the middle of that, you give me wisdom to know my part. Or that I just rest in you. What is God calling you to do? The final question is, do I call out to Jesus before I call out to others? I want us to be like that lady on the plane. Maybe not quite as loud. But I want our first response to be, Jesus, I need you. This morning when somebody tailgated me on a back road. Yeah. Oh, I have bad tendencies. I grew up in Miami. My dad, my grandfather, they were terrible drivers. Of course, like me, they thought they were the best driver on earth. And I had been praying through the fruit of the Spirit this morning on the way here. Lord, fill me with your love. Lord, fill me with your joy. And I got to peace, and I looked in my rearview mirror, and this guy was four inches from my bumper on a back road that's 35 miles an hour. He could have gone around me. He didn't. Lord, help me to love this person. Maybe his grandmother's dying. You know, I was trying to think of humanizing him a little bit. And I pulled over and let him go by. That took a huge amount of faith, because you know what I wanted to do? Break for tailgaters, Right? Right? That's what my humanness wants to do. But what? I need the fruit of the Spirit to overcome my humanness. Because my humanness is not good. And I'm a pastor. There's other things I wanted to do too, but we're not going to talk about that this morning, right? <laughs> right? So, so the truth is, even in our best state, we tend to be passive aggressive. God, would you fill me with your love? God, fill me with your joy. Fill me with your peace, your patience, your kindness, your goodness, your faithfulness, your self-control. That's the fruit. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. We'll step outside right after the service. I'd love to talk to you about what it means. Maybe you've not taken the next step of baptism. I had a young man come to me just a couple weeks ago who wants to follow in the next step of baptism, showing other people that he's given his life to Christ. If you want to do that, I'd be glad to talk to you about baptism. We'll prepare a time to do that when it warms up a little bit. Thanks for coming today. We're not passing our offering plate, but you can give on the way out or you can give online. Those who are watching online can give online too. Those in the parking lot, I think I saw you already come in and give. But um, any way you want to give, that'd be great. If you can't give today, that's okay too. We still love you just as much, okay? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for these moments. Father, I pray, just as your word says, that we could be still and know that you are God. Father, help us to rest in the fact that we know you're God and we're not. Lord, when we try to control this crazy world, when we try to think that we can put things together the right way, Lord, I pray that we could learn to rest in you. And the only reason we can walk on water is because we're looking at you. So, Father, when the wind and waves come, whatever those are, whether it's physical problems, mental problems, emotional problems, I pray we could just trust you to make it through those things. And Lord, we do trust you today. Father, I pray if there's anyone here or watching online that doesn't have a relationship with you, that today would be the day they surrender to you, knowing that you are the only way, the truth.
and the life. Thank you for these moments. Bless each one here today. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a great song to close.